Today's just a really a chance for us to walk through the exhibition, talk about each of the works, uh, contextualize some of David's pieces both within this exhibition and maybe how they connect with other pieces that he's done in the past. Uh, give you all a better idea about about David's work. So maybe I'll talk about this first piece that's here in front of Chris and I. It's uh, it's titled Wilderness or uh, subtitled Telepreneur and Trash. And uh, the story behind this piece is um, I took a uh, I did an artist at sea residency uh, last summer, summer of 2019, where I, I jumped on a, a research vessel and we went across the Pacific Ocean. And it was really amazing to be out on the surface of the water and. and uh, I, I did a couple of things while we were scanning the ocean floor, where I got some data from that. But I also collected the, the movement of the ship uh, from the waves. And I had the entire journey uh, collected in um, data, uh, basically the movements of the ship. And uh, one of the things that was really amazing about being out of the, the middle of the ocean was there was very, there's no, zero, human, anything uh, in the middle of the ocean. Um, it was horizon, as far as you could see. It was the only human activity that was visible was uh, people that were on the ship. Except for every once in a while, you would see a piece of uh, something floating past, a bucket, or a piece of rope, or a flare gun in one case. And so that's kind of where this piece came from. These are disposable uh, shopping bags that you see everywhere that are ubiquitous. And I decided to articulate them using the, the, uh, the data that I collected on that journey. So these bags are undulating in the space uh, based on the data collected from that journey. Sure. David, you said the, the subtitle to this exhibition is called Telepresent Trash, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have other pieces that are similar. There's one I'm thinking of specifically called Telepresent Trash. Mm -hmm. right? And that piece, what you're able to do is use data um, networks to sort of have the wind transported from one place to another, right. correct? In this case, what you've got is data that is recorded yeah. at that location, thousands of miles towards the sea, or at sea, yeah. and here it is in the middle of the world. Exactly. But here it is also almost a year later, correct? Yeah. 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 So yeah. tell me about how, we, how the data goes from where you recorded to where we see it now. I'm thinking when I'm, when I'm uh, collecting, the, I have versions that Chris is describing where things are going uh, Replay data in real time versus recorded data. I think right. that's the distinction. I, I guess uh, with, with my thought with this in, in that subtitle is, um, yeah, obviously it's not real time uh, currently in what's happening in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, although I have other pieces in the exhibition that, that relate to that. It is uh, kind of trying to take that particular moment, that particular place, that particular location and recreate it in the gallery space. I'm thinking about this very, very distant, very far away uh, occurrence sure. to try to recreate that movement. Sure. In this uh, a, a very, uh, I hope, formal and nice, but also kind of troubling uh, sure. uh, setup here, uh, these, these plastic bags. The camera microphone may be able to pick up the sound, but if you're in the gallery, and when you see this, like, this installation sometime in the future, there are small little wheels that are attached to the ceiling that are going up and down, creating a little humming sound. And then as the bags go up and down, they also create this really kind of thin, plasticky sound that's kind of going up as well, too. And one of the things that I've always appreciated about your work, David, is that you expose so much of the structure of these. There's nothing hidden. You know, when people see this installation, you can see the bag, you can see that there's three points of fishing line attached to each bag, and you can see how they're attached to each of these uh, 3D printed wheels that you made as well, too. Even though the data is invisible, the structure is there for us to see. And I wonder, has it always been your your idea to have those visible? And, and in that visibility, how is that different, say, than something like foam or uh, a laptop that kind of hides all the guts? Sure. I, um, yeah, I do like to show the guts. I think it's important to have like, all of the available stuff that's performing behavior or activity visible. And that often includes the sound, too. I would say that this, in a lot of the pieces that I've done recently, this is probably one of the most hidden, I guess. I, I, I created this piece with uh, our current times in mind, thinking that potentially if the gallery were to get shut down, I wanted to have something that was visible from the street. 
And you can even go by and admire this piece from the street. It runs uh, seven days a week uh, till midnight. So you can, you can walk by or drive by and see these bags dancing and they're very dramatically lit. Um, almost like they're in a fishbowl uh, sort of space. So in that respect, like the reason we got off of that was because, you know, in that respect, a lot of the sound and the mechanism is very hidden. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes kind of this magical thing. Uh, which is nice, not maybe not necessarily the direction I'm looking for. I like to I like to think of these things, and maybe we'll get to this at some point, sure. as uh, collaborations between the data, the experience, the physical moment of the ship, but also the mechanism and how I kind of map the, the data itself. Yeah. So um, yeah, in that respect, I do like to show the mechanism and also the wood and the moons is a big part of it for sure. So David, this is called Water Circus, right? Yeah. Um, it's a little bit different than the previous piece that we were just looking at because this data here, the ups and downs, the lights that we're seeing is actually live data mm -hmm. that's being streamed to the gallery from a buoy off the coast of Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a, uh, I'm using a, a National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration buoy that's about, it's about uh, 250 nautical miles uh, southwest of Honolulu, okay. so kind of in the central Pacific Ocean like where the data for the previous piece was collected, but this is live, correct? This is a real-time sort of situation like we were talking about before. I'm giving uh, six pieces of data from that buoy. Uh, anybody can go to these buoys. Each buoy has its own um, website, actually, URL that you can, you can call up, and you can get, uh, you know, they, they're used for hurricane, tsunami warning system, uh, ship navigation, sure. things like that. And so you can go to the website of the buoy and get like the water temperature, the wind speed, wind direction, but you can also get wave height and wave period data. And so I'm actually using six pieces of that data from this one buoy. I'm using the swell height, and the swells are the big waves mm -hmm. in the swell period. I'm also using wind wave height and wind wave period and wind wave direction as well as swell direction. And so three pieces of data on each wave set, I guess. Um, and those are being overlaid. So often the swells are coming in a different direction than the wind waves, and the wind waves are often much smaller than the swells. Okay. So all of that is kind of being laid on top of one another to create a very dynamic sort of surface here uh, in the gallery space. And yeah, this is the current conditions uh, of what's happening in, the, in the, the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And it'll change day to day. It'll change minute to minute as you come into the gallery space, uh, just based on what's happening there. Okay. And that matrix, that three-dimensional matrix, is um, created by a, a LED matrix, basically. We've got about 2,500 uh, RGB LEDs here that are... Uh, in all of these, stri these sort of uh, arrays that are coming in. Right? Exactly, yeah. yes, yes. And uh, uh, there's um, all of the arrays are arranged in a grid structure, mm -hmm. and then the, 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 the matrix is programmed to light along those to create the, the, uh, the 3D surface. Uh, As I'm looking at it, I'm sort of hypnotized because it's, it's really easy to just kind of get stuck into it and just watch these movements go up yeah. and down. Now, I'm not an oceanographer, and I know about a lot less about this than you do, but would you say, and I'm just trying to connect this to the, to the title, Water Surface, mm -hmm. would you say that the swell heights um, are related to the movement of the water under the water surface, where the wind would kind of blow over the water to create movement? I think that's uh, potentially that, a way to look at it. Is that a oversimplification? I mean, I think the, the, the swell, uh, I think maybe you're thinking about currents. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking the swells are maybe uh, generated by... Uh, uh, larger activities, like they can be generated by waves, um, but the, the wind uh, is more of a, or excuse me, the, the swells can be generated by wind. Okay. Uh, like if we have a big storm here on Lake Superior, it starts to create swells, um, whereas the wind uh, kind of affects more of just the surface of it, where right. I think the swells are more of a build. Got it. I um, mean, yeah. that's kind of my layman's way of looking at it. Sure. Sure. As you were describing what the buoy was doing, I'm just imagining this device out in the ocean all by itself yes. and like at try collecting and aggregating and then transmitting all of this data. Yes. And there's so much to talk about with this piece, you know, especially with the one that we just looked at. A, it's, it's live data. Yes. This is what's happening in that location as we speak, yes. perhaps instantaneously transmitted over here, right? Yes. Um, and then it's also um, that similar surface uh, feeling of being under the water, mm -hmm. similar to the piece that we were looking at. I feel like I'm sort of moving along with it as it's kind of going up and down. Mm -hmm. 
The other thing that's fascinating about this to me too is that you've created in a way almost like a three-dimensional monitor. You know, because the way that these um, strands come down, there's there are 12 by eight in this in this circle grid, but it's not just a flat surface the way that we're sort of look, way you know used to like looking at that information, but it's almost like a, a three-dimensional monitor that we're able to see mm -hmm. in that. Which again makes me get lost into it even that much more. Mm -hmm. So, but tell me a little bit about this the the NOAA system that you described. This is free information. Yeah, this it's, is it's free available data for anybody. And what I what I did just back to your your previous okay. thought there, I'd like to I'd like to kind of follow up on. Yeah. That. I mean, as I said before, I teach sculpture, and I am a sculptor. I'm a maker, yeah. and so I think a lot of data visualization uh, you see these days or is available in very screen based and very two yeah. dimensional. Yeah. Whereas I'm trying to kind of create that in three dimension. And I, I don't think of it as like maybe useful data that somebody from NOAA would be like, oh, yes, I know exactly what's happening in the middle of this yeah, yeah. I think of it as more of like aesthetic uh, choices. But also, uh, it's a collaboration between uh, myself, of course, what's happening, the natural real time data, uh, and the mechanism that I constructed to really create that. And it's creating a new sort of hybrid using all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think of these as, I, I think this, this piece, the more I kind of spend time with it, it, it has a loneliness to it. Yeah. And I think a lot of the telepresent pieces do that. Thinking about this object, this one lone object, or thinking about what I was talking about being on the ship and, and the sort of horizon, as far as you can see, you know, this one lonely object kind of just saying what it wants to say. And I think that can be seen as sort of a lament, too, yeah. like just uh, uh, in, in current times, you know, is this the way that we're going to experience nature? Right. Um, is it nature? I don't know. I mean, I think it's going through a lot of filters. So I think of the, I think of the lone person in the lighthouse yes. whose job it is to sort of keep the light going yes. uh, consistently, always, always, uh, yeah. the same way that buoy is sort of like keeping that data Keep that information flowing sure. for the safety of others. And, and back to your thoughts about no, uh, um, yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah it's, it's free, it's available to the public. You know, people will use it if they have a small craft mm -hmm. or want to just check on the weather. They have cameras and all kinds of neat stuff that you can check out, and it's all available. And what I've done is written, written, written a custom uh, web scraper that just gets that data and then uh, and then outputs it to the user. So, David, in many ways, this piece that we're talking about now is is an encapsulation of not just your journey that you did on this on this uh, residency, but kind of encapsulates the sort of like where a lot of these other pieces came from, right? Um, these are three pieces of acrylic that have been carved, starting over here on the to your top to our audience's right, all the way down here to the left. And it charts your journey from on the uh, the Falcor, which is part of the uh, the artist. Art Institute from Portland, Oregon, all the way down here to Honolulu, Hawaii. How far is that? Like 5,000 miles? Yeah, something like that. 5,000 miles. And so this is obviously shrunk down to a minute scale, right? This swath of maybe a quarter inch represents 10 miles in actual size, correct? And the depth that, well, maybe you can talk a little bit about what we're looking at in terms of like how that data was collected from the bottom of the boat. And Sure. It's actually close. It's 25 miles. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it's um, yeah. This is uh, Astoria, which is outside of Portland, where we started the journey, and then down there is Honolulu. And uh, we use this thing called a multi-beam sonar. Uh, the ship had on it. Um, basically, I was given a, a choice of different residencies to go on with this uh, uh, Schmidt Oceanographic Institute. And um, I chose the one that would go across the Pacific because I thought that sounded great. Uh, usually, what they, they do is some science, like an artist, like a painter, for example, and they come on and do paintings of the sea creatures that they find or the activities on the boat. But I was just interested in the, the data. Mm -hmm. And they weren't doing a whole lot of science during my voyage. It was a transit. They were trying to get the, the ship from A to B uh, to do some things in Hawaii. So it was in dry dock for a little while in Portland, in Portland uh, before our journey, and um, and they were just transiting it there. And the only thing they were doing was scanning the seafloor as we went. And um, a lot of ships will do this. Even non-scientific ships will scan the seafloor as they're going. And um, that information is then uploaded to Google Maps. Mm -hmm. uh, it's vetted by Google, 
And then if you look at maps of the Pacific Ocean, you can actually see these streaks across mm -hmm. the ocean. And those are transits that have been uploaded. Streaks of, I should say, more detailed depth. Like there's a sort of vague representation of the Pacific Ocean, and then there's a very, very uh, distinct streaks of more solidified data. And so that's what we were doing, was uh, using this multi-beam sonar that takes, I think it's like 180 uh, sonar beams. So it's not just one sonar, mm -hmm. it's, it's 180 it's beams. It scans, kind of sweeps the ocean floor as we're going across. And the sonar sends out an ultrasonic chirp down to the, the, the ocean floor, and then that chirp bounces off the ocean floor and comes back to the ship. And from there, they can get a distance reading. Right. So that's how they get it. They, it's just actually up to 5,000 uh, meters of ocean floor depth. They can get a uh, pretty good resolution. And while it was in dry dock, uh, the Falcor, I think this relates to maybe what you're thinking about in terms of data. Um, they painted the hull of the ship, and they painted it with the wrong paint for that sonar. Uh, or they painted over the sonar uh, collector with the wrong kind of paint. And they're like, oh no, uh, but we're not really doing any hard science on this journey, so whatever, we're just going to run the sonars anyway. And I was collecting the data, I even brought a CNC machine with me, it was carving the data as I was going. And it was kind of crunchy, but I was totally fine with it, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, I don't find that a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, right here, in the, maybe about uh, two-thirds of the way through the journey, you can see there's this kind of a uh, very distinct zone there. And we're basically going in a straight line from A to B. Um, and we stopped here and made some circles. And that's because this is Phobos um, Seamount. That was actually discovered by Falcor in 2017. And we went over that several times because they have really high resolution models of this seamount from previous journeys. And they use that to sort of recalibrate the seminars. Um, and so that's why that's such a distinct there. But anyway, just in terms of the piece, uh, it's a, a LED strips that are in the, the tops of these, um, and the, the purple kind of indicates the swath or the journey of the uh, of the Falcor as it goes across. So you'll see up here in the upper upper corner uh, when that starts. I wanted to kind of recreate that feeling of the sweep of the data as it, as it went across the ocean. David, I want to ask you a little bit more about that. You mentioned data that were crunchy. You know, it, when you talk about data and you talk about collecting information, you know, to me, it, has, it carries the impression of being sort of pure information. You know, if you're using a, a digital camera or if you're using lots of digital technology, whether it's sound or other such things, mm -hmm. there's a there's a sense that it's um, the resolution nowadays for all those devices that we have is just getting better and better and better and better. And better. Look at our cell phones. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about the amount of data that you must have collected, or the boat, I should say, collected, from that beginning to start that story all the way to Honolulu, A, it must have been massive. Mm -hmm. It must have been a lot of information to store in one place, then to get sort of like composed, then turn it into what you see here, or a future project. Mm -hmm. But with a lot of these other projects, um, there's glitches that are built into some of the projects. Mm -hmm. You don't seem to feel the need, the same way that you show so much of how the work is composed, mm -hmm. to make it pristine, uh, super high resolution data. There's yeah. always going to be little things that happen that are just going to remind you that this is imperfect. I guess I should clarify. I mean, yeah. it is it is super high resolution, just yeah. in terms of like if you're if you're just doing like a, a pixel count. Yeah. There's a hell of a lot of pixels here. Yeah. In fact, when I brought these models. I mean, this is 2,500 miles, basically, um, of, of you know, seafloor information. And um, when I brought these models into my 3D modeling software, mm -hmm. uh, even just like a 10-mile swath of that, my, my software didn't know how the hell to deal with it because it's just so much information. Right, so you're right. going to have to scale it back uh, quite a bit uh, just in terms of making it fit within the software. But I think what you're, you're saying is like, yeah, there was a, a, a scientist aboard Falcor uh, named Debs who was really great at, at um, uh, explaining to me what was happening and, and walking through the, the process. And I developed a workflow of taking their proprietary information and kind of working it through my open source yep. kind of things. Um, and Debs was really uh, great at, at, at tech stuff. And, and 
you know, they're using the, the information or the, the C4 models to uh, educate the public. And I think, you know, if, if things are a little bit cleaner or a little bit more straightforward, it's easier for, mm -hmm. for that information to be dispersed in that way. So that was really all about kind of cleaning things up. And there were lots of glitches in the, in the information, like uh, it was very wavy, as you can see from the piece that we looked at earlier. There were big waves, there were a couple storms that we went through, mm -hmm. and we were kind of hopping all over the place, which kind of screws with the sonar. Yeah. Uh, it makes like, you know, basically it's points, right? And um, every once in a while there'd be like a point way the hell up here, and it didn't right. make any sense at all, and it was just the, the sonar was kind of glitching out a little bit. Yeah. And I love those things. Right, I mean, I right, think that's right. great because it's kind of fuzzy, it's kind of imperfect. Right. And I think that talks a little bit about you know, the sort of collaboration that I was talking about earlier between uh, myself and the, the, the physical object and the information, as well as like the sort of imperfect uh, sort of representation. I mean, I don't think it would be as interesting. I think it adds something to yeah. it. And maybe it's our, our perception of it. Um, so I do embrace those things, for sure. It's the same reason why I, I, I so appreciate those moments where you're driving. There are places that you don't get some full reception. <laughs> yes. I'm so glad that still happens. <laughs> yeah. exactly. um, the other thing that I feel like is a, is a great um, sort of wonder, I guess, with this piece is that what we're looking at are three panels. They're two by four feet, roughly. Ah, uh, yes. Two by four feet. But again, there's a super amount of compression that is happening with this piece here. I mean, as you said, there's a lot of data that this amount of space that you're encapsulating into just these three pieces is massive. You can't get your head around it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then especially how this um, line that we see here, like I said, is a roughly 10 miles wide. Right. So it's a really fascinating way to sort of compress something that is so massive. Right. Uh, not just in time and distance, but in uh, just the, the breadth of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminds me again that um, I don't know if I'll ever make this journey, but gosh, it's a big planet. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think of it, 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 there's a lot of history of map making, right? Yeah. And I, I think you can think of this as a map. Yeah. 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 There, it's authored, there's a point to it. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. so. the, name of the, piece, the name of this piece is, well, we're going to shorten it for purposes, but latitude and longitude. Yeah, it refers to, the title of the work uh, refers to the latitude and longitude and altitude location from where the data was collected. And this is a very, this is the oldest piece in the show, um, but it, in a way it is similar to the other works that we've already talked about a little bit. Um, what you've done is you've taken a, an image uh, from a, with a drone mm -hmm. over a specific spot in Lake Superior, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what you've done with that is taken one, two, three, four, five different Images, correct? And they've been uh, routed, uh, or these pieces of acrylic that are roughly six and inches by six inches, mm -hmm. have been uh, routed and sculpted with those those images, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is a, a, I sent my drone out over the lake here in, in um, near, near where we live here in Duluth, and um, hovered about 30 meters over a particular spot over Brighton, off of Brighton Beach here, and uh, set, had a camera that pointed downward and then took a still image of the water. And then I have a custom workflow where I can convert that still image of the surface of the water into a 3D height map or boat map. Mm -hmm. And then that can be converted over to uh, a three-dimensional model that is then uh, sent to, uh, uh, used to generate what's called a tool path, which is then uh, carved into uh, the, the acrylic. So uh, these are taking this uh, very dynamic, ever-changing surface of the movement of the water from a particular location and then fixing it in time uh, in these acrylic cylinders. How much time is in between each of these? It's uh, about, I took it about, I, I wasn't very regular with my interval there. I would say it's about a, roughly a week between each one. Oh, so very, very different conditions and very, very different, uh, uh, yeah, the, the conditions are uh, quite variable between the years. When people see these in person, it's hard to see it on camera, but there is a lot of detail that you can get from not just the data that you're collecting, but also the machines that you're using to, to cut the acrylic. And the acrylic itself seems to be able to absorb a lot of details. It's a pretty hard material, right? So when you look at these, you can see just how ripply and but like this one is a super duper column. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as I was thinking about these pieces, considering that they're in the exact same place, but at different times, you know, in addition to the other data that you're collecting, 
this to me felt like a portrait, you know, that you're going to a specific place, um, that you're able to probably program into your into your drone, right? You can kind of tell it to go to a specific place at a certain height. Yeah. And really get a portrait, get a real a sense of what this place is like at a specific time of day. Yeah. You know, we know the mood of the lake can change quite a bit, um, but this seems to really capture almost a personality. Uh, I like if once you get close to it, you can actually see it. You know? yeah. No, I really like thinking about look, thinking about it that way uh, yeah. because it is. I mean, the drone is is relatively precise yeah. just in terms of an instrument. If you tell it to go to certain GPS. It will. It'll go there and hover at a height. Even on the like, really, I mean, here it's relatively calm. You know, there were less than ideal conditions, um, and the drone is relatively robust and will hold its position regardless of the conditions. So it is. It is really good at capturing that particular particular spot. And yeah, I do like thinking of it as like a maybe a portrait of this particular location, yeah. ever changing. And these things are never going to happen again either. I mean, maybe the lake will be a certain amount of calm, but the actual detail and the actual dynamicism of the water. Water. It's forever fixed, right. but it's never going to be the same in that particular location. And that's why I feel like there's a really important difference between your work and other sort of, I mean, I hate to use the word like landscape artist because I think your work is different than that, but for a lot of folks, when it comes to taking an image or making something of the landscape, it's, you know, looking through a, a camera lens and perhaps painting a landscape. Sure. Um, it's something that people can go back to. Sure. And perhaps there's also a way to kind of compare what the artist has photographed to, or painted, yes. to what you're actually seeing. Sure. And you can see that change happen over time, you can see that change happen over days. Um, the famous one is, is, um, is Monet's uh, Haystacks, mm -hmm. or um, the cathedrals, where you can kind of see how the day light, the time of year, changes the color. Mm -hmm. Here, our reference, the index of what we're actually looking at, is gone the second that you capture it. Right. And there's a certain sense of trust that goes along with that. That says, this image was captured at this specific time by this device right. that is then mediated, that is then turned, and then turns into what we see here finally. I mean, I think that's important to remember. I mean, technology, as we were talking about with the previous piece, is yeah. glitchy. So yeah. it is mediated. Mediated yeah. is the word. And I have been accused of being a photographer occasionally. Yeah. And uh, as you know, <laughs> it's. Uh, which, I mean, I guess you could see them in a lot of ways that way. They're highly mediated by the technology, they're highly mediated by the processes, the workflow that I develop. Each one of these pieces that we've looked at today yeah. has a particular workflow that not only uh, consists of me creating the physical object or the physical device, but also coding it. Yeah. There's a lot of that behind the scenes in all four of these that we've looked at today. And that's my hand. My hand is always in there. So I think it's impossible for us to say, like, you know, these are, these are, uh, uh, untouched. Uh, right. or just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm making choices all the way. Of course. So, um, yeah. And I think what I like about these pieces too, yes, it's, it's photography in a way, mm -hmm. but it's sculptural. Um, it's site-specific mm -hmm. as well too. It's a media piece. You know, there's so many ways that these these sculptures kind of encapsulate a lot of different kinds of art making, mm -hmm. you know, into one, even though it's perhaps easiest to sort of appreciate them for their weight and the translucency and but when you start to learn a little bit more about it, there's a lot more media and technology that goes into making them. I think 